thank you very much. You shouldn't thank me, you should thank German Railways. <laughs> the train broke down and we had to return to Saarbrücken and so I saw Vorbach three times this morning. Uh, yeah, so nevertheless I would like to talk about something that represents some research of mine which is ongoing for 10 years or so. It actually started with a collaboration with Mila in 2005. I was on a sabbatical semester and we tried to construct a backward diffusion process that is using negative diffusivities everywhere and the hope was if everybody is a criminal then they behave nicely. So that was our theory. Uh, we couldn't come up with any reasonable results at that time, but 14 years later, I'm happy to report that we have found something. So I would like to talk about stable models and stable algorithms for backward diffusion problems. This is joint work with Martin Welk. He's in Austria with two people from my group, Leif Bergerhoff and Marcelo Cardenas, and with Guy Gilboa from the Technion in Israel. And yeah, what is it all about? Well, we all know if you apply forward diffusion, then it has some smoothing effect and it has some blurring effect. So if you start with such an image, you apply forward diffusion, you get this. Of course, if you do the opposite and you would like to apply backward diffusion, you can potentially benefit from deep blurring and sharpening results, potentially. But there is a big warning Behind that, it's well known that backward diffusion processes have some sort of intrinsic instabilities. They are so-called ill-posed problems. And the ill-posed is manifested in, by the fact that a solution might not exist at all if the data is not smooth, if your initial data is not smooth. But even if your data is smooth and exists, it may be highly sensitive with respect to small perturbations of your data. So that means in practice, you will just have a hard time handling it. And this has triggered many people to refrain from using backward diffusion. And in my talk, I would like to convince you that this is not necessary. So if you do your job well, you can actually use backward diffusion and you can benefit from the nice properties without suffering from the typical drawbacks that you would expect from ill post problems. And I would like to show you two ways to overcome the difficulties. So either you can try to come up with pretty advanced, sophisticated numerics, or you can try to come up with better models, smart models, which actually allow you to benefit from well postness properties um, and beyond classical regularization approaches. And I would like to demonstrate these two principles by giving you two examples. So my talk consists of two parts. In the first part, I would like to discuss sophisticated numerics. I would like to apply this to the so-called forward and backward diffusion, which goes back to Gilboa and colleagues in 2002. And the sec some of you might know the first part, but the second part is definitely new. That's a novel convex model for backward diffusion. So typically you would not expect that backward diffusion allows convex modeling, but the surprising thing is this is possible. So that's uh, some recent work in particular by Leif Bergerhoff. And here's the outline of my talk. So first of all, let's talk about the FIB diffusion where I focus on an explicit scheme and a more efficient numerics. And afterwards, I would like to present to you our recent results on backward diffusion stemming from convex energies, where I would also like to focus mainly on the modeling here and analyzing the modeling because actually you will see that the numerics becomes trivial if you do your modeling in an appropriate way. So that's it. So let's start with the FAB diffusion, and in order to understand that, I would just like to recapitulate a very classical nonlinear diffusion model by Perona and Malik. So let's assume we have a rectangular image domain, and we have some bounded image, scalar valued image, and then you filter it by regarding this image as an initial state of a diffusive evolution, du by d2 dt is divergence of a scalar value diffusivity times the gradient subject to reflecting boundary conditions. n is just the uh, outer normal vector here. And 
What Perona and Malik proposed was a monotonically decreasing positive diffusivity function, decreasing in the gradient magnitude or the squared gradient magnitude, if you want. And the idea is basically you would like to smooth preferably within flat regions while avo avoiding uh, smoothing across edges where your gradient magnitude is large. Of course, you can derive an evolution like that from an energy. In general, <coughs> this energy may be non-convex, but typically it's monotone if you have here a positive uh, diffusivity function. And actually, your potential psi here, your penalizer psi, gives rise to a diffusivity g, which is just psi prime. So that's the simple connection from the calculus of variations. So that's standard theory. So what Gilboa and colleagues did was a modi uh, modification of that idea by allowing basically a diffusivity function that may take negative values. So as a prototype, you can think of something like that. Have a diffusivity function which starts here with a positive value C1, and it may have a shape like this, for instance, and it's bounded from below by a value minus C2, and you want that your C1 is larger than C2. So that means here there's at least one good one which dominates over the bad ones. There can be many bad ones. So that's the idea behind that diffusivity, and actually this is exactly expressed in this assumption here, and I assume here for technical reasons some sort of smoothness, C1. And in general here, this one co uh, corresponds to non-convex and non-monotone potential. It can become pretty ugly, as you can see here in the next slide. So that's, a, that's an admissible diffusivity function that gives rise to a minimization of such a potential. This one here, uses a potential like that, and if you have a diffusivity which remains in the negative area, you may have a potential which looks really, really odd. No? So you wouldn't expect that anything like that is stable, but actually I would like to draw your attention to one fact. If your gradient magnitude is zero, that means if we are at extrema, we are always in the forward diffusion region, and that has a stabilizing effect. So if there is one intrinsic stability in the continuous model, then it's exactly at that point. And that's what we have to preserve by numerical schemes. Um, what about the theory for that? Well, you can say it in one sentence, there is no theory. There is no continuous theory for that due to the backward nature of that equation. Um, classical, classical reasonings do not hold. People have been trying to use standard implementation, let's say an explicit scheme, they observe that you get over and under shoots, which can become really bad, and if you add some additional fidelity terms, or so biharmonic regularization, things stabilize somewhat, but it's very difficult to interpret in which sense this is something which uh, benefits from a nice theoretical foundation here. So that means, is it possible to establish something like a fully discrete theory which leads to practically useful and perhaps even efficient algorithm. And that's the goal of my first contribution here. So I would like to discuss with you actually a slightly modified explicit scheme. A relatively simplistic thing. So we have this equation. That's the FRB diffusion just written out here in the x contribution and the y contribution. And now you can apply a very classical explicit finite difference scheme. So you replace your time derivative by that one. The upper index k denotes the time level. The lower indices i and j specify the pixel. And tau is your time step size. Your grid size is h1 in x direction, and let's say h2 in y direction. That is here your x derivative, that's your y derivative, and this is your diffusivity at intermediate grid points. So that's a standard thing you would probably try first here. What's the problem with such a scheme? Actually, you discretize your diffusivity as a function of your gradient magnitude, and if you just say, let's take central, central differences here, and let's go to an extremum. 
Well, at an extremum, you are not guaranteed that your central differences van vanish. In a, in a continuous setting, this is no problem, but in a discrete setting, this may not be true. So it can happen that in extrema, you get here a positive contribution. It cannot be negative, it can be zero, but that's very unlikely, so it's very likely that you get something positive. And if you have bad luck, you get something positive here, and that means you have a negative diffusivity, and that means you get over and under shoots in your extrema. That's the reason why standard schemes fail. And actually, there is a, there is a pretty useful little modification that solves this problem. You can replace here your squared gradient with that standard approximation by a so-called non-standard discretization. That's just the product of a forward difference times a backward difference. And if this product turns out to be negative, you are in extremum. And then you are entitled to replace it by zero. And the same, the same in x and in y direction, actually. And you can easily check by consistency analysis, this has a consistency order two. This also has a consistency order of two. So formally, you don't lose anything. This is just closer to the physics in that sense that it guarantees you that in discrete extrema, you have also a discrete gradient approximation, which is zero. And in that sense, you benefit here from a positive diffusivity. That's a very simple idea. And actually, if we just have a few additional technical requirements, so if we denote here the range of our image by R, and since we have a smooth function, a C1 function, and here the value C1 is larger than C2, actually there is a little interval here, omega times R, where we are larger than the worst negative diffusivity, actually. You know? So that's a simple continuity reasoning. And this was just to introduce the R here and to introduce here this value omega, because we need that for stability analysis. And then we have proven uh, with a somewhat, somewhat cumbersome uh, derivation, as you can expect from a formula like that. Uh, that this is a stability condition which guarantees to you that everything works out nicely. So actually, that means if you have a time step size which is below that limit and you have some diffusivity function which is smooth, which has these constraints with respect to C1 and C2, you guarantee that the process is well posed. Well, that's not too critical. You have a, you have a unique solution anyway by an iterative scheme but it's also stable with respect to perturbations of your data. Your average gray value remains constant for all time levels here. You benefit from a maximum minimum principle, which is caused by the fact that at extrema, you're always in the forward diffusion region, so you don't produce over and under shoots, also numerically. You can create Lyapunov sequences, that means discrete counterparts of Lyapunov functionals. Actually, the, the range is a Lyapunov sequence, so the range decreases monotonically and it's bounded from below by zero, of course. And last but not least, we can also prove convergence to constant steady state. So that means a simple explicit scheme with a small but powerful modification, namely this modification here does the job. You have a full theory which allows you to come up with numerical simulations that, that preserve the physical properties of the process. That's the good news. The bad news is this guy here is extremely restrictive. So this gives you time step size limitations in the order of 10 to the power of minus 5, 10 to the power of minus 6. And typically from forward diffusion you have something like a limit of one-fourth or something like that. No? So that means you, you are suffering from uh, slow down by several orders of magnitude, and that's, of course, not very nice in practice. So the question is, this scheme is nice in theory, but it's too slow in practice. Can we speed it up without actually sacrificing some of the, or all of these nice theoretical properties? And 
Yes, it is actually possible uh, to come up with a much more efficient numerics, and I would just like to present to you the building, the building bricks here for that numerical scheme. And um, yeah, so first of all, we have to understand why is this estimate so restrictive? It's so restrictive because it's based on a worst case analysis. So we are always using the most pessimistic estimates because we estimate our time step size a priori in the beginning before we start our process. However, these restrictions are neither necessary at all locations nor at all times. So that means they apply only to a few small, uh, to a small subset of the pixels in space and in time. So the remedy would be that we are as adaptive as possible and use estimates that we generate during the evolution, so that means a posteriori estimates. And yeah, locality adaptivity is something which is actually very useful here. And what's the most local and the most adaptive ingredient in a numerical scheme that we can have? Well, it's a two pixel interaction. And uh, this can be justified in a very simple way. So if you look at your explicit scheme, so that was the formula which I have shown to you already, you do have two pixel interactions. So the pixel ij interacts with i plus 1j, and here, so that means your right neighbor, here you have a left neighbor interaction, an upper neighbor and a lower neighbor interaction. So essentially, your scheme has an intrinsic Two, it has four intrinsic two-pixel interactions. And we benefit from that, and actually we decouple it and split it as much as possible. So first of all, we perform the two-pixel interactions not in parallel, but sequentially. That allows us to guarantee the stability of the process. It's easy to guarantee that if you do it sequentially and each of the individual two-pixel interactions is stable, it would be much more difficult if you would have to guarantee stability when they all interact at the same time. Um, then you need a time step size for such a two pixel interaction. There are two scenarios. You can be either in the forward or in the backward diffusion region, depending on your diffusivity at the intermediate grid point. If you are in the forward diffusion region, you can basically just determine your time step size such that the order of your gray values is not swapped. No? So that a maximum remains a maximum after this time step. If you have a negative diffusivity, you cannot be in an extremum because at extrema you're always in the positive region. So that means you're somewhere here. And then actually what you have to prevent is that your, your um, non-extremal pixel does not grow in excess to its largest neighbor in order to preserve stability. And so that means locally we can basically estimate stability conditions. They are highly localized in space and in time. Uh, in order to avoid any directional bias, we randomize the two pixel interactions. So it's a stochastic or probabilistic scheme in that sense. And in order to come up with results at a given uh, time level, we synchronize at certain times. So we have sick times where all pixels reach the same time level. And this is just done by selecting the probability of the two pixel interaction in such a way that it's proportional to the remaining time until the synchronization happens. So that means these are the ingredients to localize and adapt the scheme as much as possible. And actually, this is something which gives you uh, numerical experiments which allow stability. And let me show you a few experiments here. So that's the diffusivity that we choose here. It's a complicated formula with two parameters. Basically, the lambda tells you where your minimum is and the kappa tells you how broad this negative diffusion region is, actually. Uh, I report some runtimes on a standard PC architecture without any GPU tricks or anything like that, just single core runtimes. And the first experiment shows you comparison between 
the standard, the naive discretization, and the non-standard uh, discretization. Well, that's just the difference between unstable and stable. No? So actually, after not that large diffusion time, a, a standard discretization gives rise to a completely divergent scheme where you lack any, any stability in many of the pixels. And the non-standard discretization gives you nice results. However, you have to obey the small Times this, this severe time step size restriction if you're using the explicit scheme. Yeah? However, it's nice. It just gives you a sharpening uh, in certain regions while you smooth in other regions, so you have really forward and backward diffusion in the sense as it is intended in the model. Okay, as I told you, this is slow. How slow is it actually? Well, this took 66 minutes. Yeah? because you need one million iterations with that small time step size in order to have a stopping time of 10. With our two pixel scheme, we introduced the sync time of 0.1, so that's the maximal time step size in that sense. And on average, we are extremely close to that, so we are at 0.991, so that means we only have a very small percentage of two pixel interactions which are responsible for the time step size restrictions. No? And that means in practice, you can replace your 66 minutes by 7.7 .7 seconds, and that gives you a speed up of a factor 500. Just by smart numerics, and since your two pixel interactions are intrinsically stable, you don't lose any of the other nice properties from theory. No? It's just trying to design something which is more efficient without sacrificing the nice theoretical properties. Um, you even have a scale space behavior caused by the Lyapunov functionals and conversions to flat steady state. That's exactly what the theory predicts. Also your numerical scheme gives exactly such a behavior. It's no problem if your initial data is, is noisy, it will be smooth. And as you can see also, edge-like structures are preserved or may even be a little bit enhanced. You have contrast enhancing properties. And so that means also with respect to scale space properties, your scheme is exactly doing what it's supposed to do. It's even surprisingly stable under noise. You can add noise, Gaussian noise with sigma equals 50, and we have truncated it outside the usual range from 0 to 255, as is often done. And the forward and backward diffusion gives you a result which is reasonable for denoising. It was not designed as a denoising scheme, so you wouldn't use backward diffusion for denoising, but as you can see, it's not that, it's not even that bad. So you can get all the nice benefits from the model without any drawbacks, and you're still efficient if you come up with somewhat more sophisticated numerics. So that was the first message. So one opportunity to tame ill post problems is to look at numerics which captures the essence, the physical properties, and which basically reduces the interaction to the smallest units you can handle, in that case, two pixel interactions. The second thing I promised to you was smart modeling. Can we actually avoid the ill postness while still benefiting from backward diffusion? That sounds absurd and impossible, but it's actually possible, and you will be surprised how simple the model is. So that's the second part, backward diffusion stemming from convex energies. And the goal is actually to avoid the typical problems that we have so far. So either we have to come up with sophisticated numerics, you may not like that. So it's of course always more elegant if you have a simple model that doesn't need sophisticated numerics to produce interesting results. What people also did alternatively is they that they introduce some fidelity weights, some data terms like u minus f squared, in order to avoid that your solution runs too far away from your initial data. But of course, that implies that you have to put a weight in front of it. Um, it also implies that your result depends a lot on the initial data. So it lacks also a little bit of elegance, I would say. So the question is, is there an alternative by coming up with a smart model that doesn't lead all, need any of these things and allows you to use standard numerics, the simplest numerics you can think of, and you're still guaranteed to come up with a stable evolution. 
And I would like to show you actually that you can design a method which has globally ne negative diffusivities. So it's positive at no location. It stems from a convex energy. That's the real surprising thing. And a stabilization, so the only stabil stabilizing assumption that I introduce is that I have some sort of range constraints reflecting boundary conditions in the co-domain. So if you have, say, a gray value range of 0 to 255, it just means you explicitly impose that your filtered result is not going beyond that interval, outside of that interval. Uh, so that's the idea. And in order to show you how this can be modeled, I would like to restrict myself to 1D scenario with interacting repulsive particles. These repulsive particles are simulating kind of a backward diffusion evolution. So let's assume here we have an interval from 0 to 1. We have here seven particles in that order. And that means here they have certain values in 0, 1. You can think of actually this as a grayscale range. Then what I do is I reflect that scenario from the interval 0, 1 to 1, 2. So the counterpart of 7 is 8, counterpart of 6 is 9, and so on. So that's a trivial reflection, doubling the number of pixels from n to 2n. And then I just consider an energy like that. No? So I have a penalizer function psi. This is kind of a discrete derivative, you can say. And now everything depends on the choice how you select your penalizer function psi. No? So I want something which is repulsive, no? so which is doing some sort of backward diffusion. So what I choose is the following, this one. So we are interested in the, in the interval 0, 1. So I'm using a penalizer function of that shape. It's large in zero, but it's a quadratically decreasing function towards one. So that's the explicit formula. And here it goes up, but that's not relevant, actually, because we want to live in that domain. No? And so this is extended by reflection, by symmetry. And then we can also extend it periodically to the entire domain if we want. So that means formally we can assign values everywhere. So that's the penalizer function I'm interested in. Obviously, it's convex in the grayscale range I'm interested in. Um, what about the gradient descent evolution? Well, you do your standard job. You take your, your energy. You compute the derivatives with respect to the individual vi's. And then you have dvi by dt is minus the derivative. With, of the energy with respect to the VIs. And then you immediately get this here, this function. And you may interpret this as a discrete diffusion, because that's your diffusivity. That's your UX or your UY. And if you sum up, actually, you get also divergence. So this is a discrete diffusion model. And you may call this, actually, the flux here. So the psi of S is. Psi, the, the phi of s is psi prime of s squared times s. So you have a diffusivity function, which is your derivative of your potential. And you have a flux function, which is psi prime times s. No? So that's the standard, how you can interpret these things. And we know, of course, here our psi. So we can compute the diffusivity and the flux. And how do they look like? That's your diffusivity, and that's your flux. So let's have a look what that means. So we are interested in the interval from 0 to 1. So the diffusivity actually can be computed as 1 minus 1 divided by s. So for those of you who like TV, here you have it. We have actually a backward TV flow, a shifted backward TV flow. And actually, in your interval from 0 to 1, it is nowhere positive. No? So it's actually completely in the negative area if you stay, if you stay uh, below 1, actually. Your flux function looks like that. It's also completely negative inside the interval from 0 to 1. So obviously, that's a backward diffusion model, as backward as you ever can think of. 
And surprisingly, it comes from a convex potential. No? And that guarantees the stability of this guy. Um, so what can we prove for that? Well, postness, actually you almost get it for free. You, do your, you use your standard tools from dynamical systems. You look at Lipschitz continuity, which gives you existence and uniqueness for an ODE system. And Kronwald's lemma actually helps you to establish stability with respect to your data. So it's well post, this process. You have a strictly convex energy. It has a unique minimizer. Uh, the gradient descent evolution depends on a continuous way on your data. We have also proven that such particles that they can never reach the domain boundaries. So by this reflection and periodic extension, I have implemented basically uh, these reflecting boundary conditions. They can also never occupy the same position if they start at different positions. So that means they can never cross each other. So they are order preserving. Uh, you have a strict global minimizer, and you get, via Lyapunov reasonings, you get convergence to your equilibrium point as the time t tends to infinity. And in that case, where you have these repulsive forces, you can actually easily prove that you get an equidistant particle distribution in your interval. You can say that's perhaps the main thing you can blame this model for. The steady state looks somewhat boring. It's the maximum distance that you try to occupy with your particles. No? Uh, but if you drive your car to an empty parking lot, you also try to maximize your distance. So that's what we are doing all, all day long. No? Uh, yeah, You can modify these things a little bit in order to avoid here the somewhat boring steady state by introducing non-negative weights to your particles here. Then you have a slightly modified model, but essentially the good news is, in spite of the fact that your particles may have different weights, you, ha you still benefit from the, from the full theory, uh, so you don't have any drawbacks. So the main thing is that your steady state now has a different analytical description. So we still have an analytical solution for the steady state. It depends on your weights, and typically if you have weights like that, it just means that the, the fat particles occupy more space around them, and that also looks, looks pretty natural. So that means also that model can be covered uh, with a full theory without any problems. What about numerics? So the, the theory is, is, is done with that. What about numerics? Well, the answer is trivial. The numerics is absolutely trivial. Use an explicit discretization and be happy, that's all because it's a forward it, it, it's, it stems from a convex from a convex energy minimization so you just need a standard time uh, step size limit which is given by the Lipschitz constant but that's not exceptional that's what you have for all for all explicit schemes so we are not suffering from any additional restrictions due to negative diffusivities so a forward uh, is a standard forward Euler scheme, an explicit scheme, does a good job. And I should actually emphasize that for backward diffusion, explicit schemes are more stable than implicit ones because the explicit ones look into the smoother, uh, into the smoother past where the implicit ones would look into the rougher future. So it's exactly the opposite than you have for forward diffusion. And this algorithm can be proven to reproduce all the stability pro properties of your continuous evolution. So that means you don't reach your domain boundary with your particles. They do not cross. They are order preserving. So in that sense, they do everything what you have from the, from the uh, time continuous model. And that means you can, just, you can just run an explicit scheme. So just for the sake of uh, completeness, I'm here mainly interested in the theory, but just for the sake of completeness, here's a prototypical application. We just use it for contrast enhancement. So let's say we have a digital image here with nx pixels in x direction, and y pixels in y direction, and grayscale range within 0, 1. Then what I do is I just assign here the weights in such a way that if a certain gray value i appears n times, then I say my weight wi is n. So that means I use my weighted scheme 
that I showed you as a modification. And then I just run my explicit scheme for some given time t. I could also go with t to infinity because I know the analytical solution, so I don't have to use an explicit scheme in that case. I could ju just apply my steady state solution if I prefer that one. But often the evolution is more interesting than the steady state. And then of course you can map your, uh, your processed gray values to the original ones, so that's your contrast enhanced image. And this is how it looks like. So here we have an original image. This is for a stopping time which is not too large. If I increase my stopping time, you see the contrast is more and more balanced. And in the steady state, actually what you get, one can show that your steady state is not that interested. interesting. It's, um, it's a classical histogram equalization. But you have a PDE-based embedding of a classical histogram equalization. And I would argue that probably I would prefer that as an enhanced image. And as I said, that's just a prototypical application. You can localize these things if you want. We also have results for color images where you go to YCBCR or to HSI spaces, which connects it a little bit to the previous talk and to walk by Mila and Gabi. So, but that's not the main task of my talk. I just would like to show you that actually there is no reason to fear backward evolutions. You can handle them. You can handle them either numerically or you can handle them by smart modeling. If you prefer the numeric way, so this is the take home message that I have for you. So uh, first of all, try consider replacing standard discretizations by non-standard standard ones that reflect the physical properties of your evolutions. That's very important. Then try to localize your interactions as much as possible. If you have two pixel interactions, you are as locally as possible. You can adapt your time step size to the local constraints that you have. And the asynchronous splitting allows you simple stability guarantees because you don't have to consider what happens if they all interact at once. And if you randomize, you avoid directional bias by the asynchronous splitting. So that means these are some standard tricks I would like to, to advertise when it comes to numerics for, for backward parabolic problems. The alternative, which I personally like more, is actually try to design models that actually overcome the ill postness by for instance, strictly convex energies. So energies that are convex can still allow backward parabolic processes. This is something I didn't believe two years ago, but then uh, I was surprised to see that it works. And a simple stabilization can be done by range constraints. It's also very natural stabilization because typically you say, OK, I have a grayscale range between 0 and 255. And for encoding my result, I don't want to leave it overshoots are okay as long as they don't cross 255. And in that sense, it's a very classical or, or very practical constraint. And the nice thing is you can use the simplest numerical schemes. You can basically use whatever you would, you would like to use for forward process, for backward process, if this backward process can be modeled by strictly convex functionals. So that's my message to you. And if you would like to read a little bit more about that, this uh, numerics for the FAB diffusion has been published recently in the uh, JMIF special issue for SSVM. There are also earlier conference versions on that. And a conference version of the second part uh, has been presented at the last EMM CVPR, and we are currently in the process of preparing a, a more detailed report, a journal version should be ready in the next days, basically. Uh, that's it from my side. So you can fetch these things from our publication web page. And for the case that somebody is interested in a postdoc position in our group, I would also like to advertise this here. If you have some background in optimization, variational methods, or PDEs, feel free to contact me. Thanks very much.
So thank you very much for your talk. Are there some questions? Yep. Thanks very much for the talk, uh, Joachim. So I was wondering, uh, so w the second model you presented is that you went from uh, a local model to something which looks like a non-local model. And it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's sort of non-local lifting of your problem, so it has no regarding effect. So it's, it has any relation with this if you choose the kernel appropriately? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a non-local model, actually. We have the, the interaction here is chosen in such a way that uh, let's, let's go back. That the pixels actually interact over the full domain. Uh, so it's a non-local model, but we also have in that uh, more advanced technical report localized models that allow local contrast enhancement. So that's no problem. You can localize these things. The theory becomes a little bit more difficult then. Uh, that's the drawback. And from a practical viewpoint, what may not so nice is if you have a certain bandwidth of your kernel, you should be happy if your neighboring particles are within that bandwidth. So that means you have the uh, typical problem of bandwidth selection that you have with lots of kernel methods. No? But essentially the theory can, can be generalized to localized models, yes. Um. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm wondering about the stochastic uh, approach. Um, <laughs> do you use it just for numerical reasons or also for theory well, and how to do it? Yeah, just pe 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 people who know me know that I'm not a stochastic guy, so I don't use stochastics if there's no real need for it. And I just use it here to get rid of directional bias. So there's one thing which I hate more than stochastics and that's directional bias. <laughs> <laughs> and Therefore, if I randomize my algorithm, I make sure that on average, in the expectation <coughs> value, I don't have any preferred direction. An alternative could be you can also come up with deterministic schemes. So if you run, for instance, from the top bottom to the left right, then you should run in a second step from the left, left right to the top bottom and try to compensate for these things so that on average you also have the chance that you are without any bias, so this is something that you have in a Gauss-Seidel procedure, for instance, or these typical things. But personally, I prefer the randomized versions because in practice you don't see these randomizations. No? Yeah. So it's a tiny little noisy effect which is so small that you don't recognize it in practice. And of course, the more iterations you choose, the less you can see these things. And actually, if you just, if you just have a look here, that's a deterministic scheme, that's a stochastic scheme, and if I zoom into it, deterministic, stochastic, it's not identical if you look at the boundaries, but you will have a hard time judging what is better or what is worse. They play absolutely in the same league. So on average, I think it is justified to do it in that way. But we also have deterministic two-pixel schemes which do essentially the same thing. It's a little bit easier to explain the stochastic one, so I've chosen this, this version uh, in order to keep the talk more accessible. Yeah. Thank you. In, anything done for dynamic images? For what? Images that change a lot in time, like medical images. Uh, I, sorry, I didn't understand. Dynamic. Dynamic images, so yeah. image sequences or something like that. Yes. I don't see any reason why you shouldn't do it for image sequences. I think it should just be applicable to image sequences if you want. So there is nothing that prevents it from being used in that context. Yeah. But I haven't done any experiments personally. Nice talk and ideas. What happens if the codomain is not the real line? You think of any manifolds or something like that? More general range spaces, yeah. Color, for example. Simplest case. Um, so, so we have versions for color, but actually I should say that our color versions are grayscale versions in disguise because we go, for instance, to the to the LUMA channel in a YCPCR representation or to the intensity channel in HSY, HS, 
HSI representation. So in that sense, we are not going to some specific manifolds yet. So I essentially, I think that the reasonings that we have in that paper should carry over to more, more advanced manifolds. At the moment, I can't see a reason why it shouldn't be possible within these things here. Yes. On your slide, you have different parameters. How do you fix them? I suppose that according to the value you give them, the convergence is different. Um, what do you mean, the first part or the second part of my talk? Second part. The, the, the second part, um, let's see. Well, well, actually, I don't have too many parameters. I, I only have one uh, in the second part because I have here a fixed a fixed penalizer function, so there's nothing to negotiate about that. The only, the only free parameter which I have here is the diffusion time. No? So in that sense, it's only one parameter to choose and that tells you how close your filtered result should be to the, to the initial image or if you're really interested in coming close to your steady state, which is kind of histogram equalization. I mean, in that sense, uh, if you want to do histogram equalization, you can do it more directly. Um, it, I, I think the interesting thing is somewhere in between here, and it's a single parameter. Um, ironically, I could answer, my personal experience is, if you have a model which has one parameter, everybody will ask you, how do you choose the single parameter? If you have a model with 100 parameters, nobody asks you. <laughs> okay, have there some further questions? Yeah. Um, coming back to the image of the cow, so were you able to come up with a potential to invert this procedure? I mean, the normal heat equation corresponds to linear potential, so you could just choose minus that potential, which would no. be convex that, as well? That, that doesn't work. I, okay. I can't convexify Pity. linear diffusion. I can't do miracles, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I could just try to discover a few hidden gems that have not been used before. Um, so I don't think that it's... At least at the moment, I cannot see it as a completely general model, the second idea. So. Mm -hmm. It's, it's useful in those scenarios where you have the liberty to design your backward diffusion process. So my advice would be try to design it in such a way that you can come up with convex models. But in general, for most models, the inverse model will not be convex, unfortunately. So nevertheless, then you still have the chance to use the first idea, namely sophisticated numerics to capture the dynamics. And my personal experience with these for instance, if you just say linear diffusion and you do it backward in time, my personal experience is you can stabilize it by one single trick, namely just setting your diffusion to zero in the extrema. That's all. So that's the minimal stabilization. That's an old story. It goes back to Osher and Rudin in 1991. And they even present a min-mod scheme which uses some upwind discretizations and this works pretty well. So that means what I would recommend if you just want to invert a standard parabolic model, stabilize it at the extrema by preventing over and undershoots and then use basically hyperbolic ideas. Ideas from the numerics of hyperbolic uh, PDEs, that means upwinding min-mod discretizations in order to stabilize things. You lose one consistency order, but essentially you capture the dynamics of the process pretty well. Thank you. Okay, so thank, thank you very thank much you. again. I think it's time for the coffee break.